um, hey everybody, it's so good to be back with you on Facebook Live. Thank you guys all for joining us. Today I have a friend and a really incredible guest, and I know so many of you who follow me deal with mold, and that is our topic today, so you're in for a treat, and you're in with one of the neatest human beings that I know um, today, Jeff Bookout. Um, I will formally introduce him in a minute. Um, just a few housekeeping things. I will be watching the feed here, so if you have questions or anything you'd like to ask, um, be sure and type them in to the comments. I would love if you'd share this with friends, family, people you know who are maybe dealing with a mold situation and have questions. Um, and we will be sure and post resource links um, on the live um, and the recorded. So if you miss this or you catch us halfway, this is recorded, it'll be on our Facebook page. And um, it'll also be on my YouTube channel. So I'd love for you to subscribe there as well. The same videos are all recorded and on YouTube. Um, one last thing, I've gotten a lot of requests for um, updates on upcoming Facebook Lives and things that we're doing. And uh, you can stay tuned with that by subscribing to my newsletter. It's super easy if you have your phone out, all you need to do is text to, the, to a number and you'll sign right up free to that newsletter. It's free, we never share your um, information with anybody. And in order to do that, all you need to do is just type in um, the number 66866. And in the um, subject line, just Dr. Jill, doesn't matter lowercase or uppercase and hit send. And then it'll ask for your email and you're on the list and then you'll get all my content, which is all free. Um, Jeff, it is so awesome to have you here. And you know, so far it's just been friends and people that I love and respect that I have here because it's so fun just to have a conversation. And even today we don't have an agenda, so we're just gonna wing it and talk about mold, but I really think we're gonna hit on a lot of important things. Um, I wanna hear your story and I don't have a formal written bio from you, but I think I can introduce you as, I don't know how many years ago we met, but um, I've been in the business of helping people physically in the office with mold, but I cannot do what I do without people like Jeff Bookout. And he has come to be so loved and respected and trusted by myself, um, my colleagues, and so many of my patients. Um, what's funny is I'm in Denver and Jeff's in Oklahoma, but he spends about half his life in Colorado and we're so grateful out here because um, what I told him before we started the call is this industry of mold remediation is kind of like used cars. <laughs> and I hate to put you in that category, Jeff, because you're the opposite. But what I find is there's a lot of um, unsavory and untrustworthy people that take advantage. And my patients that have this and myself years ago, um, they're suffering, they're, they're mentally having trouble with brain fog, and it's a really difficult situation the way it is and then to have someone who takes advantage of that is so hard you are the exception to the extreme you're a man of integrity a man who does the right thing who's really really good at what he does and you know just like for myself in medicine there's the science and the knowledge base and you have that in spades but what you also have is you have an intuitive sense and you have kind of a special smell and you have some of these gifts that you were just god given um, to be what to do what you do and do it well um, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got interested in this industry and kind of your story of where you arrived, where you're at now in the mold remediation business, or actually mold inspection business. You bet. So thank, thank you, Jill. Extremely humbled. Uh, you're right. It's a God-given talent. Uh, but, and, and I think trials and tribulations are always in your life a reason uh, and we're to learn from those. So the strange thing is, is I, I have two 18-year-old daughters right now. They're eight and a half months apart, but my youngest daughter uh, she was getting sick from mold exposure. And it was funny because it was in the house I grew up in. So my, my parents' house uh, uh, down in the basement would show up, you know, stay the night. Anywhere from four hours to four days later, boom, she's hit with 104 degree fever. By 2 a.m. it's strep throat. Strep throat ends up going on, this goes on 16, 20 times a year, take her tonsils out, strep attacks the side of her face. Well, my first reaction is, what's wrong with you? Uh, I slept in the same place you did, ate the same things that you ate, uh, and, which happens with a lot of people that I see. And, and luckily, it was my child and not my wife, uh, because I don't think I would have been so compassionate and caring if it wasn't, which taught me another lesson. I should love my wife more than I love my kids. Uh, so, so then it's break down the data. Okay, I have a lot of friends that are doctors, uh, ear, nose, and throat, and some other specialties. And and sure enough, it was a mold reaction. And it ends up being the HLA gene in her particular case. The liver wasn't producing glutathione to remove those toxins and they were staying trapped inside of her body. So going through this journey with her and finding out why she was sick and I wasn't 
one that, that obviously helped from this aspect in sitting down and talking with people because there's a lot of people that go into their properties and the husband's not on board, the wife's not on board. Why are you sick? I'm not sick. And it helps me because I've gone through that situation. So that's kind of how I got started into this, but it was, this, it was, it was everything kind of fell in my lap all at once. Uh, I had a couple ear, nose and throat doctors ask me, uh, they knew what I did for a living in the past and uh, things were going great, working 80 hours a week, uh, not had two babies at home, not spending time with the wife and kids, things weren't going well. Uh, so, you know, I decided uh, I'm going to put God first in my life and let everything else fall where it may. And when I did that, uh, this door opened up and I was asked, Jeff, there's this company that was founded in Colorado. It's done wonders for ear, nose and throat patients that are exposed to mold. Will you bring something like that to Oklahoma? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't, even, doesn't even sound fun to me. Uh, but, but a long story short, or make it as short as possible, I ended up going to a seminar, uh, met with uh, a lot of property management groups. And I was fascinated from that aspect because we went to Keystone and Beaver Creek. And I'm, I love skiing. So we're in Beaver Creek condemned condominium unit. And the guy who owned the units was there. And it was not rocket science to me. You look in the master bedroom closet of each one of these units, there's where Stacky Botrys was growing all behind the wall. And at the time, I just knew it was, you know, it's black mold, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look on the outside of the house, that's where they ventilated these units. And it's just a hole inside the wall. Well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but it snows up there quite a bit. Snow goes right behind that wall. Water equals mold. There we go. So then they got to the doctor portion of it, which I was doodling on my notepad and and I look up and there's this young nurse taking this 80 uh, year old guy in my mind to the next room over. And I'm okay, look down, look up. There's a 40 year old guy, same nurse going to the same room. They said it was the same guy. Wait, that's, that's impossible. And that's what got my attention. Uh, that was an 80 year old guy I saw and he was dying. It was a country music star got exposed on his tour bus and couldn't get him better. And he goes to these doctors and th th there he was, night and day better. So that's kind of how I got introduced into this to, to make a long story short. And it's greatly benefited my family because now I'm to a point, Kenzie, my youngest, is fixing to go off to college. And she's stayed in dad's bubble for, you know, the last 17, 18 years. And now it's, okay, it's off to college and kind of, you have some story to this, you go off places and get exposed somewhere else. So it's those learning tools that I'll be able to talk about later that will help her along her path and journey, growing up and going to college and going to an apartment, going into a new house. So some things and tips that I can give her. Jeff, I love that. And you could take all day with your story. And I'm sure we'd be, I mean, really, truly, those are the things that really matter. And, you know, I always say, I didn't choose mold, mold chose me. And it sounds like you have a very similar story. Like, I really feel like God, like, like my experience with mold was so horrific. And you see me now, I'm healthy, overall doing great. But I was not like that. If I would show you photos of how scarred with acne and how swollen and how full of hives, I mean, I was in horrible shape and physically exhausted and brain fog. And I literally don't know that year that I got exposed to the stacky battery side the worst. I don't really know how I survived and I did. But um, part of that journey, just like yours was because I really feel like God was like, you know what, I'm gonna teach you. And the best teachers experience, right? And struggle, you've been there just like me. And again, that's why I recognize you, Jeff. That's why I recognize your heart because you go into every single house, every single patient you talk to, and you bring that heart. And that's so rare in this industry. And yet with these people that are suffering, I mean, I don't know if I've seen any other illness that's quite like mold in the fact that it affects the amygdala, which is the fear response, and it affects the brain and it affects. So it's not just someone who has fatigue that's struggling with um, an issue with the physical body. It affects the mind. I've even had experiences where there was a, a church I used to attend that was moldy and every time driving home, I'm not a depressed or anxious person, but I would drive home and the world was ending and I could see how people would be depressed or suicidal and that's not me, but the mold would sabotage my brain for several hours and I really understood how it affects the mind and the judgment and all these things. So you're at, when you're going in there, you're dealing with these people who are already compromised and they what they need most is love and compassion. And I think both of us hopefully bring that to them because they're in a really dark spot. And then there's so few people who really understand it on the level um, that you and I do. And that's an important thing too, because 
like you said, whether it's their parents or their siblings or their people in their household, their partners, most people think they're a little crazy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. And sometimes that sometimes you have to play play moderator a little bit when you're in there. But it, at the end of the day, it in in I make people cry for two different reasons. Uh, one is coming in, in in the first 15 minutes, we sit down at the table and we go over history of the house and history of them and, and some of that. And I don't know how many times I see the tears start to flow right then. You understand. Yes, I understand. Uh, I've been there. I've done this. So yes. In the other part of the tears. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. The other part of the tears. Yeah, the other part of the tears is sometimes, in my job, I have to be brutally honest sometimes, and I am extremely compassionate, but sometimes people need to hear what yeah. they need to hear, and it is what it is with me. And so sometimes, and, and it's when this X, Y, Z has to be done in your house, because if not, you're living in this toxic mold environment, this has got to get done. And when you're talking someone's livelihood, their money, and everything else, and then the tears start coming. I still love you, but yeah. you got to yeah. hear this information. That is so true because I, I took me a few, maybe a year to really understand how, um, at, same thing as a physician, I'm asking them questions. When did this, I just had a patient the other day, chronic cough, been to ENT, pulmonology, the best in the world. No one can figure this out. So all I did was say, well, when did this start? And how long have you been in that house? Well, within a week of moving into this rental house, the cough started. Mm, you know, both you and I are going, of course, right? And then, of course, I see mycotoxins in the urine that are metabolites of aspergillus penicillin. I see a dust sample because at that time they didn't have an inspector yet of aspergillus penicillin. And I put all the pieces together and clearly that's a, um, a trigger to a chronic cough. Um, so we, we put the puzzle together, but no one, they'd seen uh, dozens of doctors. No one had put that together. No one had asked them about their environment. So uh, it's so key. So tell me what you do when you first go in, when you talk to people, what are the questions you ask? So what I want to do today is kind of give people some tools to think through if they're suffering from symptoms, um, how they might involve someone like you and what kinds of some of the common questions that people have. So the first thing let's start with is like, what are you asking people? What kind of questions? Where are you looking at in their house? You, you bet. And I'll, I'll come back and I'm, I'm going to put it, something in front of this too. Perfect. But when uh, I, I finally arrive at the house. Uh, obviously, somebody suspects there's a problem, whether it's, it's the doctor, they, you've looked at C4A, MSH levels, whatever the case is, ERMI testing. Some, some, for some reason, we suspect something's in the house. So we, we number one, go over history of the property, uh, past water leaks, backups, floods, what type of moisture intrusion, because moisture equals mold, mm -hmm. whether that is an ongoing leak, a past leak, water up against the foundation, a swamp cooler, things that are allowing moisture or even humidity. Humidity, in my opinion, is a debatable number above 50%. Mm -hmm. So once you get at a 50% humidity level, so I'm in Colorado every other week, basically, and I hear it all the time, Jeff, we're so dry here. Colorado is, you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in your basement and you're 65% humidity. Well, at 50% humidity, I know there's going to be pockets of higher humidity. And once you're to the 60, 65 range, mold will start growing on surfaces, just thriving off the high humidity and dust in the air. Uh, went to a church uh, not too long ago, 70% humidity. Mold was growing all over the back of the vinyl chairs. Well, it wasn't a water leak, roof leak. It was because we shut up the church. Everything got hot in Oklahoma. Humidity gets that high, mold starts to grow. Same thing with a lot of schools do the exact same thing. Uh, so it, it's always moisture intrusion that I'm looking for. So when we sit and talk, I want to hear past history. Now, so quick sometimes question. we don't. I don't interrupt you, but it's so important because I think uh, what you just said with COVID and things closing, unoccupied buildings. This lady with a cough, they moved into a building, a home, two years, no one occupied it. What's the risk there? Is there something you mentioned, the humidity and the condensation, but would you be more concerned about a building that had been unoccupied? Uh, from a general standpoint of view, yes. Real estate transactions, this house hasn't been occupied for a year, depending yes. on where you're at in the nation. I used to travel the country. So obviously here in Oklahoma, humidity outside today is 85, 90%. You're 30, <laughs> you yeah. know where you're at. So in, in these hotter environments, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, even coastal states, it's more of a concern. Uh, 
generally, let's say without a water intrusion, closing that envelope up, generally you're going to have high levels of microsporum, cladosporum. It can get all the way up and start going to aspergillus penicillin. But if you had a water intrusion there to start with, so there's a mold problem underneath the sink or in the bathroom, it just Blows magnifies it that by a thousand. Yeah, it just allows that to spread. Okay, so back to sources. I interrupted you, but I thought that might be important because people, you know, have heard yeah. that. So back to where else do you look? Um, you're talking about a different uh, So, and a lot of times people don't know this information or Jeff, I moved here a year ago. Uh, so a lot of that is the instrumentation that we use. Uh, so there's a lot of ways to test for mold and that's kind of the precursor. So a lot of times doctors uh, such as yourself, you like the ERMI, there's ERMI testing, SDA auger plates, there's air cell cassette, a lot of different ways to test the air. Mm -hmm. I, I, I look at them all because it's data and I love data, but incomplete data does not complete the picture. So unfortunately, there's not a tool out there that I'm able to pick up and say there's mold behind this wall. It's a combination of a bunch of tools put together. Air testing one, which I love, whether yeah. that's uh, qPCR, the dust DNA analysis. Uh, I have a lot of people that do the SDA auger plates or Petri dishes. They're a snapshot in time, yeah. but every tool has its flaw. Those flaws are, let's say you have a water problem behind this wall. Mold works like a dandelion out in the yard. As soon as you kick it, blow it, disturb it, thinks it's going to die, throws its mold spores to regenerate somewhere else. So behind this wall is my master bedroom. So if that master shower has a leak behind the wall, it's fat, happy, and content back there. It can still be releasing mycotoxins and MVOCs to make me sick, but the spore count may not necessarily be high. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the flaws of that tool. There's infrared cameras. Uh, if it's not wet right now, infrared camera's not going to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does do a good job, like in Colorado, there's missing insulation. Well, if there's missing insulation there, there's more than likely a condensate issue there. Got it. Uh, moisture meters. In, yeah. Is the um, foam better than the old um, fiberglass? Is there anything with insulation where you'd recommend one over the other for people either building or choosing? I, I do. So I see crawl spaces a lot. So uh, in, in a if I was building a house from scratch, I'd love to have this conversation because it's, it's rock wool insulation. It's foam board insulation. Uh, it's not fiberglass insulation that's full of chemicals, petroleum. Uh, but most importantly, especially in a crawl space environment, which we have a lot in Colorado, uh, let's say it's in a crawl space, water's gotten into the crawl space, contaminated the soil. All those mold spores and mycotoxins, dirt, dust, debris get trapped into that exposed insulation. So it's a problem. So if I was doing an attic, okay, if you want to use regular insulation, bag it. Use plastic backed insulation, nothing exposed. Got it. Uh, closed cell and foam cell insulation uh, it depends on the usage sometimes. If it's below grade, I don't like to use it. Um, and the attic is generally okay as long as somebody doesn't have super chemical sensitivities, okay. but it does give off VOCs. Okay. So foam board insulation, rock wool insulation, they're good. Got it. So back to sources, and I want to talk because Colorado, okay. swamp coolers, crawl spaces. I want to talk about those two particular, and anything else in particular in our environment, we might not have the humidity, but we still have massive issues. So what do you see in a dry climate like Colorado that you might not see in Miami? Like, what should we be aware of in our patients? What's your most common, like, yeah. top five sources? So number one reason why people get sick from mold exposure is a crawl space, mm -hmm. by far, and that's not just in Colorado, but right. it's that silent hidden killer. Everybody wants me to come in and show them that big black hairy spot all over the yeah. wall. If it was that simple, you don't need me. Exactly. All right. So, so it is, that's the, the thing that people don't see contaminated soil. Mm -hmm. If there's a lot of excess of mold growth in the insulation, if it's on the subfloor, they're not in that crawl space. If they smell a musty odor, Yes, you have a mold problem. That's MVOCs, mold volatile organic compounds. Mold is feeding. It's active. You have an issue. Now let's find the source. Mm -hmm. uh, so crawl space is number one. Uh, second place, swamp cooler. There again, it's hidden. Uh, Stacky is usually growing in the water itself or up the sides of the filters. Uh -huh. So they don't see it. It right. is blowing those, those uh, toxins into your environment. Um, Three, in, at least in Colorado, a lot of stucco. And some of the houses I get to see are straw hay bale insulation uh -huh. behind the wall. So if a lot of cracks in stucco or cracks over time, moisture gets into that, there's hay back there. Okay. 
what grow as soon as that hay gets wet, it's it's mold, uh, and, and a lot of it. So I always say crawl space air, attic air, air behind the walls. Those areas will contain five to ten times higher mold contaminants than what's normally in your breathable air without a water intrusion. So it's sealing off those outlets, light switches, things like that. So if there is a problem back there that's not recognized or not very large, it just keeps that from coming into your breathable air. And I know because I've been to your website, biobalancenow.com. We'll talk a little bit about your products, but um, you have videos on there teaching people very simply how to seal outlets, how to seal um, vents. And these things are really simple. I am so not mechanically inclined, but I think I could probably do it. And that's saying a lot. <laughs> so, um, and Jeff has the videos on his site that's explaining it. And if, again, I love that you say that because that's houses that don't have a massive mold issue, but they just have this, um, you describe it best, but it's basically the airflow that should not be into your living space, right? And it's leaking in there and causing, you always call it Scooby-Doo gas. Explain that just a little bit for our listeners. Yeah. So, so let's, so, uh, you know, having all girls uh, in my household, it's Scooby-Doo green gas. So now you get a visual of this gas. Uh, so it's not always the spores making you sick and be the mycotoxins in the MVOCs. So now imagine that a Scooby-Doo green gas, so now you can see it. Yeah. So you have all this mold contamination in your crawl space. Well, underneath your crawl space where your kitchen is, you have pipes that go up into your kitchen for your kitchen sink. There's a hole around that pipe. Well, when your HVAC system comes on, your heating or your air conditioner, it creates so much negative air pressure, it's like a vacuum and it sucks that Scooby-Doo green gas from those cavities and brings it up into your breathable air. So, and which goes to, uh, you know, one of those points, a lot of times you'll find someone's mold problem in their house, they fix just that area. And if you don't address the entire building envelope, wow. that Scooby-Doo green gas is all over that building envelope. Wow. And if you don't address that, you're missing a lot of the picture. Yeah, so let's talk about practical things. So we got uh, crawl spaces, uh, swamp coolers, the attic air, the crawl space air, the intra wall air, whatever you call that, all of these sources. Um, and then there's common things that people don't think about. I had a small little eight inch circular leak under my sink from a garbage disposal that was improperly installed. Not a big deal, right? Well, no. Um, and so the things like uh, washer leaks and um, improperly uh, connected hose from a refrigerator under the sink in bathrooms and showers. Um, nowadays, gosh, I've seen so many brand new, beautiful multi-million dollar homes where the tile was improperly installed, the grout wasn't sealed. Tell us a little bit about master bathrooms because there's so many things that can co go wrong with construction, master bath, the tiles. What do you see in master bathrooms and, ma and bathrooms in general? Yeah, and I'll use two analogies because I love analogies. Uh, and one of them, uh, you actually know the person, but I'll, I'll use somebody else. Uh, we get through most of the house and the house is actually looking pretty good. And the guy is, uh, he had just put in a brand new shower. Uh, well, he used travertine, uh, mm -hmm. uh, highly absorbent yeah. and excessive moisture is getting behind the tiles. That's one of the things that a moisture meter is great for in scan mode. It tells me how much moisture is back there. And there's a certain point where I'm pulling tiles and there's a certain point where I'm just resealing tiles. But in his case, you know, it's maxing out my meter. And, and unfortunately, this shower is brand new and he just built it. He did not want to hear it. No. Uh, but at the end of the day, let, let's go back to a story that you do know. I go into her, her home and sure enough, she's got excess of moisture, same thing, behind those, those tiles. Now, you don't see that visually. Sometimes you'll see some cracks in the grout or some things where water is getting back there, but you don't always get to see that. So in her particular case, uh, it was maxing out my moisture meter and uh, not even a thought on my part, this has to come out a minimum of this high. And, yeah. and uh, so sure enough, we saw the pictures afterwards and uh, full of mold growth all underneath that, that cavity, uh, not all just the into the ceiling. through seat. the subfloor. So this entire subfloor. Wood subfloor was black. Like, and you see that all the time, but I was like, wow, <laughs> no wonder. They, this is an interesting story, no details, but the husband had been sick for years. It's funny because I had talked to her 
and I had heard his story and it didn't make sense with what they were putting it together with. And my mind thought, I wonder about mold. But then honestly, because I'm the mold doctor, the mold expert, I was like, it can't be mold. Mold isn't everywhere, right, Jill? Like I actually pull back sometimes and don't think, because I really, um, I know about mold. I hear, same with you, you probably see it everywhere because you know so many details about the potential. And it's amazing. I, I would guess one in four houses has issues, maybe more. What do you think about that, the commonality of this? <laughs> so, so w without a doubt, and I get asked that question all the time, Jeff, how many houses do you go into and you don't find mold? It's a loaded question because I was hired from a medical perspective. So more than likely there's mold there uh, b before I walk in, the chances are pretty high. Uh, but every house, even my own home, Jill, this is funny. I do this for a living. I had three major water intrusions in the last year in my house. One of them flooded uh, at least a third of my house. I do this for a living. Yeah. We're all going to have problems. Yeah. It's, can I dry it out within 48 hours? Mm -hmm. And if not, I need to remove those damaged materials, treat the air. And yeah. as long as everyone kind of understands that protocol, you, Jeff, how do I get in a mold proof house? Good luck. Well, uh, <laughs> you, you have water to it. Uh, yeah. So, so there, there's always a moisture intrusion. You're going to have it happen. It's let's do things to help prevent it. Like putting those little water bugs underneath your kitchen sink in your laundry room, things like that to alert you to those areas that that could have leaks without you knowing it for a long period of time. Yeah, so let's switch gears just a little. I like that because people are even, and same way for me, I had this little water leak under my sink, which I still haven't taken out the wood, Jeff, but I promise you I will. Every time you come over, you're like, um, Jill, cut it out. <laughs> oh, bad, bad Jill, <laughs> but I will. Um, but um, some practical things. So I have a r rubber mat, which again, I need to actually take that sink. It's under the sink. I'm going to actually cut it out, replace it. But if I had done that first, which is the first step, a rubber mat can be helpful. And then what you do is you buy a little water meter that sits on that mat. So if there's a few drops of water, it'll start to alarm. Because what happened before was a week or two went by and I didn't know that there was a leak under my sink. Super common because you don't hear it, you don't see it, you don't smell it. And that leak could be going for a year or two before you notice the wet or the moisture. Um, washer dryers, uh, again, you, you can chime in here, but I got, a, I finally got a front, I still have a front load, but I got one from LG has the widest rubber gasket and they're tilted. Nowadays, a lot of the front loads are tilted and they're very specifically designed to be anti-mold. I still run a botanical product through there every month to kind of be sure. Um, and I make sure and replace my gaskets every year too. So I still have the front load, which is not recommended, but I feel like I've done enough things with the style and the gaskets and the, I did a lot of research on it. I feel pretty good about my front load washer. If you want to be sure, top load's going to be safer always than a front load because I'm sure you see a lot of mold in the gaskets, right? Um, what are the preventative things could we do um, with windows or with attics? Or we talked about the, um, the, the sealing off the airflow, but is there anything else you'd recommend as prevention for, for baths or um, kitchens? Yeah, so in, in a perfect world, uh, uh, what, what grows mold? Uh, sheetrock, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm underneath my kitchen sink uh, and I'm replacing anything, that's going to be hardy backer board or concrete board in, instead of sheetrock. Kind of take away my building materials uh, on master showers. And this goes for every single person out there. If you have a tile shower, you need to use a tile grout and impregnator probably every two, three, four years to redo the seal on that grout. If not, over time, water keeps hitting that grout and breaking down its waterproof barrier that it has, and you need to reseal it every few years. Uh, so there's a lot of things there. Let's talk about attics. Yeah. Attics, you need to have a way for air to get into your attic and a way for air to get back out of your attic. Uh, I was in a guy's house, I was there last week, and it was 75% humidity in his attic because it was so hot, he had very little airflow. Uh, so uh, humidity equals mold, so let's let's, uh, make, make sure we have airflow in those attics. Then the second thing is making sure that my attic air does not communicate with my breathable air. Uh, so little, little tips like that around the house are always great because everywhere is a, basically everywhere you have a water source is a source for mold. So humidifiers attached to the HVAC. I see that a lot in Colorado. That yeah. filter has to stay clean. The filter housing has to stay clean. The drain line that, that sends that condensate down to the, to the sewer drain uh, needs to remain clean. Uh, Cause if not, every time your HVAC system comes on, it goes in there. Okay. Oh, so many questions on my mind that I think people are 
want to know. So let's talk about um, filtration system in your, how often should you change air filters? What kind of MERV rating if possible? What would you do with your furnace and HVAC system as maintenance? And then also what would you do if there had been an issue to clean it? You bet. So, so there's five things in my own house that I always suggest, suggest everyone do. Uh, uh, and I'll get to the, the two at the very end because we haven't talked about that. But MERV rating of 11 filters. Uh, everything will have a MERV rating on it. Uh, sometimes HVAC companies don't like uh, a lot of air restrictions. So if you have a real old unit, sometimes they're not good to use. But in my own home, that's what I change out at least every three months, a MERV rating of 11 filter in my HVAC system. Uh, number two, a good air purifier. Austin Air is what I have in my own home. Uh, if we're on a budget, put it in the area that you're spending the most time in. That's generally your master bedroom. And they're portable. You can move it if you wish. Uh, in my house, we have three different ones. Uh, I'm not trying to cover my square footage, all of it, but I want a good air purifier in my home. Uh, number three, dilution is the solution. So sometimes airflow is the, the big key. In Colorado, you open your windows and doors a lot, but what about the basement? A lot of times that gets missed. Uh, so an HRV system in the Colorado area for warmer climates is called an ERV system, heat recovery ventilation. You're basically bringing fresh air in, taking all air out, because you have this little building envelope. Anything that happens in there stays in there. Mold, radon, Lysol, hairspray, bleach, ammonia, perfume, all those allow this toxic little pit that you live in. So get proper airflow in there and get everything diluted back down. The other two that we didn't talk about, which is on my website, uh, which is I dry fog my own house once a year and we'll get and dive into the dry fog in a little bit or some of those solutions, but it's GSE based, grapefruit seed extract. Uh, what do I want to use in my house that is safe for my medically sensitive daughter? Uh, so it's a true dry fog form, stays in the air from 30 minutes to two hours, being able to capture all the excessive dust, dirt, debris, mold, virus, bacteria, get it back out of the air. I do that once a year in my own home, no matter what. There's a liquid version of it that's a mist. We use that once a month throughout the house. And that's how I maintain my environment and how Kinsey will when she goes off to college. So it's, it's those little things that help maintain your own house. Then if you do strategic things around the house, like the water bugs, walk around your house once a year. Uh, pretend you're Jeff. You're, you're, you know, this, not, not a lot of it's rocket science. Hey, if there's water there, I'm going to open it up and take a look at it. it. Smells funny. I may need to holler at somebody or it looks funny. Yeah, no, and I love, so the fogging, let's stop there real quick, because you have, it's uh, just to repeat it, we'll list it, biobalancenow.com. I've used this product personally, and what I always get from patients is I'm super sensitive, what can I do? So um, I know Jeff's told me, and you'd back this up, you could have a bowl of cereal sitting out, and you could fog, and you could eat that cereal. Now, I use GSC in patients all the time to treat fungal overgrowth. I use it as nasal spray. I use it as oral drops. I even put it in my dog's water. So this is a very, very safe botanical, and it treats candida. It treats mold. And so to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, I typically I recommend, as you do, Jeff, that if you're really sensitive, that while you maybe have someone else do the fogging and you get out of the house for 12 hours, you know, right after, is that what you'd recommend? But it's not harmful. It's only if the patient's sensitive, they might have actually die off from, say, they have sinus candida or issues in the gut. You might, when I know when I treat patients with GSC, I'm like, go slow because you might have a headache or you might have brain fog because they're killing off this toxic. Um, organism. So it's not that it's toxic, but if you are colonized and you are breathing in that fog, my friends, the ones we just talked about, they did the fogging. They both had a little bit of a headache. They were fine, but because they're colonized, it's not because the product is an issue. So tell us exactly like how would this fog work? Um, they can get it at your website. They can buy the fogger themselves. Um, and that's what I did because I actually have all of your products because I'm going to plan on doing my office and my house at least once a year. And then um, have, I have the travel version. I have it all. Tell us real quickly, though, the basic fogging of what people would do um, and how that would work in their home. You bet. And I'm going to preface it a little bit. So, so let, let's start with, in a perfect world, I want three things to happen when we have mold contamination. One is I need to find the moisture source and make sure that it's removed. Yes. So whether that's high humidity, an ongoing leak, water against the foundation, moisture has to stop. Number two is finding and identifying those mold damaged materials and making sure they're removed and replaced or proper corrections are made. There is not a substitute for that. Then number three, we treat the air to get all those excessive mold spores and mycotoxins back under control. So in a perfect world, it's 
always removing that source. Make sure nobody misunderstands anything. If there is mold colonization, it has to go. Now, can I buy you time? Because uh, we had this question earlier. Uh, can I buy you, Jeff, I'm in an apartment complex. Mm -hmm. I have two, three, four, five months left on my lease. I can't get out. They're not going to fix the problem for me. What can I do? Let's fog. Let's treat that air and let's immediately at least buy you some time. It's not the perfect thing. And, and I've also heard this as a negative comment coming back from a few uh, sources that if you are treating the mold and there's still a colonization in there, they'll be putting out more mycotoxins. That is never found in my case. I've done this for 17 years, uh, treating people's houses. I have never seen that and I've never heard of that. So, so I always believe in at least I can buy you time, clean your air as best I can until you can make those right decisions. Or Jeff, I can't afford to make all those remediations yet. So I'm going to fog first, yeah. do all the steps, yeah. then fog afterwards. And that's fine. At least it gives you an alternative. I always say people like Jeff and IEP or a mold inspector is always the best to have in an environment. Not everybody can afford to have me out. I, I understand that. So I want to be able to appeal to everyone. What can you do if you can't have me there? One is, is JW Biov at Immunolytics Labs. They have come up with a medical scale for SDA auger plates. T test your air yourself for a fraction of the price. It's the cheapest way to do air testing uh, that I've ever seen. And it's reliable and it's accurate. As long as you don't have mold behind the wall cavity, you know, so, so then they also get a consult from them. Somebody like me that is in the field calls them and goes over those results. Uh, so it's not as good as having somebody like me there, but at least we have another solution out there. Um, it's always best to have a professional remediation guy remove and replace your damaged materials. A lot of times that doesn't happen. I understand that. So let's, I try to educate them on go to Home Depot, get a zip wall system, contain that room, rent a negative air pressure and air scrubber machine and use it while you're taking out those damaged materials. So there's ways that we have allowed you to do it yourself. I treat properties all the time uh, with that fogging. There's also the do-it-yourself kits mm -hmm. at biobalancenow.com. So that is not rocket science. It is, it's to me in my house, it's Halloween time uh, so, or fall festival time. So every, all the kids love me. We fog up the house. My kids play in the middle of it. There again, I know, I know my kids' breathing habits and everything else. If you go on the website, there's precautions. Stay out for at least 24 hours. Wear a little N95 mask while you're using it. TSA made me put it in my mouth and in my eye to get it on a flight to Salt Lake City before. Wow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Like, it's okay. Got I me on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Got me on the plane. So, so, so let, let's talk about or dive into a little bit of, of what the dry fog is. Why we use a dry fog? Because every other way on the market is, some people say it's a dry fog, but basically it's a wet mist that goes up in the air. Imagine taking a Windex bottle, spray it up. It's a real fine mist, falls out of the air extremely quickly. So if I have, imagine mold spores as golf balls. So now I can see them into the air. If you take water and throw it up into the air, you're going to capture some of those golf balls, but not a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So dry fog staying in the air from 30 minutes to two hours, it's able to flocculate everything together and get it back right. out of the air, which is another perfect point because you'll see on our website afterwards, I want you to do a good general wipe down of all your horizontal surfaces afterwards. Mm -hmm. Because if there are dead mold spores, virus, bacteria, dust, dirt, debris that has fallen out because of that fog, do a good general cleaning of your horizontal surfaces. In a perfect world, Jill, if you could do a small particulate clean, have a company, there's yeah. a company in Colorado that does that, great, that's about six to $8,000. Yeah. Uh, and if you can afford it, man, I love it, let's do it. But if not, do the fog, do a good general cleaning to get rid of and start over with new dust, dirt, and debris. Uh, so we talked about GSE, uh, grapefruit seed extract, lemon, lime, tangerine extracts, the dry fog uses a food grade propylene glycol as the carrier. Uh, so it's allowed to stay into that air. I yeah. want it into everything. Yeah. Your, your cabinets. So you're, you're, opening about drawers, you're opening everything you can so that this actually gets on like in your clothing drawers and in your closet and in your, yeah. Uh, yes, so because it is not wet based. Go ahead. I'm going to try to recap from kind of layperson, and you tell me if I got anything wrong for people listening. So 
Say you have a mold issue. First of all, ideally you get an inspector, but what Jeff and I are understanding is some of you, you can't afford it or you need to find a way to get by initially. And there are things to get little ideas of what might be going on. Nothing's perfect. Those are plates. Those are ermy dust sampling. There's, um, there's actually mycotoxin uh, DNA sampling. So there's ways you can do. I agree with Jeff, none of these are perfect because I'm the same way in my office needing data, but I don't always have an inspector to help me like Jeff. Um, I often ask the patients for ERMI because I've seen enough of them. Now, let me talk real quickly about ERMI and you correct me if you feel differently. I think we're on the same page. I don't sure. even look at the score at the bottom. The validation of that test has been kind of thrown out the window. So the ERMI score itself, I mean, I look at the number, I don't make too much out of it. But what I do do is I run down the individual numbers because I know which molds are really nasty. If I see above five of stachybotrys or catomium, those are such nasty molds. They cause immune compromise, kidney dysfunction, lung dysfunction, and brain neurological disorders that if I see above five of those, I'm concerned. Whereas aspergillus, penicillin, it might be above 100 or above 50 that I'm, I'm still concerned, right? But those are the guys that I won't, I don't even want to see one but if it's above five, I'm concerned. So I'm actually looking at the numbers. I do a hurts me score. None of these are perfect, but I found when I look at the individual species and sometimes I'll see some random thing like Cladosporium at 200,000. Well, that's not a common mold that causes massive toxicity. It does cause respiratory irrit irritation, but with the level of 200,000, there's gonna be an issue somewhere. So then we know crawl yeah, space. And there's there's probably space. a crawl space, yeah. Exactly. So, so, um, so I do like the ERMI because, again, a patient can do it on their own, but optimally inspection. So then we find a root cause. Say it's a shower tile issue. Say it's an under sink issue where some particle that has been porous, food for the mold, has gotten damaged. No amount of fogging will take care of that problem, but it might buy you time. So you ultimately have to take out the material, get remediation, or like Jeff said, we don't recommend doing it yourself, but if you have no other options, at the very least understand contamination, um, uh, containment. Because what happens, I've seen too many times, someone tries to do it themselves, a husband who means well, and they don't contain it and they get way worse. They make their wife way sicker because they blow it up. Um, and again, so you take that material out, you clean it up, you, um, you contain it, um, and then the fogging, and I usually recommend patients get their HVAC system clean. Would you recommend that, Jeff, before or after the fogging um, for the cleaning? I'll, 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 always after. Uh, right. And the reason why is if there is a lot of excess of mold spores that are up into an HVAC unit, uh, we're taking care of those with the fog right. before we get in there with a rotor rooter and spread everything worse. Got it. And I think I have some personal experience with this. I did some sort of treatment that wasn't the dry fog. I won't mention any names. It made me way worse. And um, what happened was I had a very dirty HVAC system. I think it dissolved. It, it kind of spread everything around and it didn't really take care of the issue. Your system worked. <laughs> so the, to me, there was a really big difference. And it was partially, yeah. my problem was a really dirty HVAC system that needed cleaning afterwards. Um, so now funny, my dog is, is whining and I wanna talk about pets. So what do we do with pets? So he was perfect, he must have heard me and known that we we're gonna you know, talk about pets. So what do we do with these guys? <laughs> You, you, you bet. So, so I always look at two different things, elephants and red flags inside your house. Now, generally your red flags, your pet, isn't always the thing that's making you sick, but it contributes to your toxic toxic barrel. And I don't know if the plan is is real up there on the right-hand side of where I'm looking no, to your left fake. on the wall. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So plants, plants are a red flag. So what can we do with pets? Uh, there is a company called Citra Safe. It is spelled C-I-T-R-I, -I, then the word safe, S-A-E-F-S-A-F-E dot -E -E com. Uh, they make uh, a pet kit. So it is shampoo, some stuff you can spray on them, drops, GSC drops that you can put in the water, uh, things like that to help maintain my pet because I'm not going to get rid of my it's, it's not right. a dog. It's a Yorkie. It's four pounds. You have to be more than four pounds to be a dog. Uh, so, but I can treat that or same way with uh, carpeting. I do not like carpet. Uh, so I didn't win the battle in my own house. So I have most of the carpet gone, but I'll use the Haven mist from biobalancenow.com or the Haven clean to clean my, my carpeting with. Um, and again, on Citra Safe website, they have laundry detergent, which is another thing that comes up a lot. Uh, I looked at a mold report, which is the SDA auger plates from immunolytics.com. Uh, I was looking at those and everything in the house looked fine, except 
the blue bedroom closet. And if she hears me on this, I'm talking about you, the, the blue bedroom carpet uh, or the blue bedroom closet had excess amounts of penicillin in it. And my first thought is, okay, is there damaged carpet in there or something behind a wall cavity or is it just the clothes, uh, which is very possible. So, uh, uh, you know, treating it or washing your stuff in that laundry detergent would be a great idea. Oh, so you just hit on the last few things we'll talk about. So I want to talk about items in your house, what to do if you really have a big issue, what can you save, what can you not save? And then another uh, thought uh, came to me, standing water. That's always a problem, right? Because people are like, oh, well, I have a sump pump that has standing. Whenever there's standing water, whether it's a plant that's overwatered, whether it's a sump pump that's flooded, whether it's a crawl space, that's always going to be an issue, right, Jeff? You're exactly right, because what grows in standing water? Uh, after 48 hours, uh, microbial growth, you know, uh, bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, mold, virus, bacteria are all going to grow in there. And if you look at how a sump pump works, there's always standing water in the bottom of that sump pump if you have a water issue. Yeah. Then as soon as it gets to a level high enough, then it pumps it out. But there will always be standing water in there. Get a plexiglass cover to completely seal it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Or they, they make fully enclosed units, but that air in that pump can, or that pit mm -hmm. cannot communicate with the breathable air. Fish tanks, a problem waiting to happen. You open up the lid and you see all the mold and algae yeah. growing on the bottom of it. I don't mind the flowers that you got for Valentine's Day. That's okay. Those are in and out. But permanent things that have standing water in them, it's a mold problem waiting to happen. Yeah, no, I love that you say that because I have this beautiful water feature in my office and we don't have water in it. It's, a, it's like a, oh, I don't even want to tell you the cost. It's a full marble of a fountain that's so beautiful. And I don't run water because of my patients and I'm okay with that. But I had to understand that it's standing water, not going to work um, in my office for sure. Um, so last thing I want to touch on is items in the house. I'll talk a little and then you add in where I might have missed things, but people are always asking about what can I, so first of all, let's assume there was a big mold issue in a home or environment. It's been remediated. The area has been fogged. So you've done everything you need to do. What do you do with your books, with your, in my experience, paper tends to be difficult. Now, sometimes we'll have scrapbooks and things that are precious. What I tell patients is if there's stuff that you don't want to get rid of, put it in a plastic bin stored away from your breathable air in your garage until you get well and then you know it's safe. Because for me, I had all these medical books from my office and they were precious to me. I stored them, but two years later, I opened it up and I got sick. I got rid of them. So I knew that those books um, were not going to be in my house. Now, I've heard patients that do ozone treatments on certain things, but I would not count on that if you're very sick from mold. You want to be careful. So books, paper can be an issue. Um, I also I'll always tell the story. I moved to a new office after my office was filled with mold and I took nothing with me except my patient charts. I stayed sick and I had labs that proved it for three months until I scanned those charts. So that paper was literally the only thing left from there, but it kept me not feeling well. Um, clothing I found you can wash and I know a citrus safe has a botanical product you can use in laundry um, and there's a few other things out there uh, I would try to use a, a diluted borax solution or a citrus safe or something along those lines to wash your clothing I in my mold experience had no clothing that I had to get rid of but there can be things like leather goods or stuff that's not very washable that you may have to part with or be cautious but again in my experience clothing can be usually washed mattresses that you're sleeping on. I would not take a chance. I say, get rid of your mattress. I'm sorry to say that, but that to me is non-negotiable. Same with pillows. The linens on your bed could be washed, but I'm just like, don't mess with it. I had a beautiful family of four. I think you worked with them too. Two darling little kiddos. They had completely remediated their house, done everything. And around the holidays, they were going to get a new mattress and they had still not been feeling well. Well, for fun on their way out, they all took the mattress down the stairs. Like just let's play on the mattress and like slide down the stairs. They were so sick. They all four called me the next week and it was all because that mattress had puffed its mold spores and VOCs all the way down the stairs and the entire family got sick. I'm like, well, that teaches you not to play on a molding mattress. But it was a funny story, but the truth is mattresses are, are bad. What other things would you think about um, warning people in a home that they'd have to be careful after a mold exposure with re-exposure? So you, you, you hit everything on the head and, and probably, you know, your top four things, books, papers, uh, they're, they're horrible, absorb a lot of mycotoxins. Uh, uh, my number two is mattresses as well. I always tell everybody new pillows every two years, no matter what. It's amazing how much you drool and sweat, 
Yes. Uh, now, if you had a protected cover over your mattress, it may make it a little bit better. But in, especially if it's over eight years old, get rid of it. Because you used that analogy, them going down, and, and it hit me in my mind. I was in uh, around Fort Collins, and sweet lady, uh, she was awesome. Uh, and luckily, I'm a redneck. But we were up on the top floor in her master. She said, Jeff, every time I sit in this chair, I get sick. I know that chair because my grandma had a chair just like that. <laughs> I said, it's like carpet. You just get over time so much dust, dirt, debris, mold spores, it just accumulates and there's no way to get rid of it. Well, Jeff, can you get rid of it for me? No, I'm sorry. I don't do that. You can throw it over the balcony. I'm a redneck. So I pick up this chair, throw it over the balcony, but I wish I had the camera on because when it hit the cloud of stuff that came out of that, that chair was horrendous. Oh. And they're all looking at, it. I was like, Oh, how nasty. Well, wow. that's the perfect analogy yeah. Yeah. of what, what happens to mattresses. There's a mattress down the uh, stairs in the family that got, I know it's just like a great story because it's so relevant. Um, and it just made me think about, you know, that's one reason why I love books. I love libraries. I love old bookstores. Guess what? I never go into anymore. If I'm on vacation, I see an old yeah. bookstore. Never, never, never with my history. And if you're listening out there and you've had mold issues, I'm sorry, but old bookstores are not your friend. Libraries also could be an issue, even if they're new and clean because they have old books. And then the other thing, um, the secondhand stores and Craigslist furniture, be careful. You know, we all want to save a buck and I'm all for that. I used to love, you know, secondhand finds and cool things. I don't do that anymore because you just don't know where they've been. Yeah, so a general rule of thumb on all belongings, no visible mold growth, mm -hmm. no visible water damage, mm -hmm. most importantly, no malodor. My, I have one of those God-given gifts as a nose. Uh, it smells like either the musty old basement, urine, or the old antique smell. Yeah. But if your nose is different, if it smells funny, mm -hmm. get rid of it. Okay. Uh, Jeff, it's an item I want to keep, okay? There's some things that we can do to help that, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so it, it's no malodor. Then four, if you still have a reaction to it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Salt Lake City story. Uh, so long story short, I, I still have my backpack, my gear on my back or on my back, go down their basement. The wall looked funny. Put my hand on the wall. My hand goes through the wall. Uh, oh, no. Stacky Botrys all behind there because of a sprinkler cavity. But I remember seeing all her clothes in the, in the unfinished basement hung up on string. It's like, man, there's no way all this stuff's going to be contaminated. But after treatment, the only thing that she wasn't able to salvage was a couch. Wow. No visible mold, no visible water damage, no malodor, but she still had a reaction to it. So if you fall into those four categories, best to get rid of it. Yeah. Jeff, it's my wedding dress. Okay, we can try the Citrus Safe laundry detergent. We can set it out in the sun. Uh, there's some things that we can do to try to salvage it. But if it still has that malodor, get rid of it or put it, put it in a sealed plastic container, get it outside of my breathable air. Yeah, good, 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 good. Gosh, we covered a lot. Um, any other last tips or things that you can think of that might be important for people listening who maybe don't have access to you or I? Um, I did link, um, if you guys are listening or looking through the feed, I put Biobalanced app now, I put Citrus Safe, I put, um, oh, and I'll mention my new product at the end here, Jeff. I'll tell you about, I think you know about that, but tell me any other tips or things that you would uh, like to tell everybody who's listening? Any last things? Yeah, I, I think the, the two biggest things, that, and we've gone over them, but it's the three things looking for, stop moisture, remove damaged materials, make proper corrections, treat the air. Those three things are a must. Then the five maintenance tips that I have, fog once a year, Haven Mist, which is the uh, wet-based solution once a month because it's cheap and easy, the Merbrain 11 filters, proper air exchange, and Austin Airs. Uh, so it's kind of staying in that maintenance routine, uh, going forward, all your patients, they're sensitive. They have yeah. HLA, gene, MTHFR. There's some, some reason why, why they're getting sick. They need to stay on that maintenance protocol. Yeah, gosh, I love it. And thank you for being available. Because uh, again, think of, for every person you can see, there might be a thousand people who watch this that can't see you or I. And I know that there's pearls here that are so powerful. I wish I would have known all this five years ago, but we were both kind of chosen to do this work. And so here we are. Um, I just wanted to add the end for any of you listening. Um, same thing as Jeff, I developed a product. It's called the Miracle Mold Detox Box. And this is for people who can't see me. It's not perfect, just like anything else, but it's a great, great tool for those of you who are suffering and want to get started and maybe don't have a physician to kind of guide you on the journey. 
Um, what I would say is start slow. I actually literally have, so I put the link in there. It's molddetoxbox.com. And today is actually the official launch. I didn't plan that, um, but I wanted to be sure to mention it because the website's up. It's got so much information. It's got testimonials, interviews, information about all the products. And of course, any of you who um, know me or see me are, in, are ingredient reader, label readers. So it's got everything listed. There's no gluten, there's no soy, there's, no, there's nothing toxic in it at all. And the basic is we're um, mobilizing toxins with glutathione and liver um, support. We're um, helping your body excrete with binders. And then we're replenishing your body with electrolytes and NAD, which is a cellular energy source. So I've been, put a ton of thought into this over the last several years. And it's in combination with Quicksilver Scientific who makes really great liposomal products. I'm so excited to have this launch because I know it's gonna help many, many people who can't see uh, an expert like Jeff and I to get started. What I'd recommend if you do purchase the product, start slowly, um, but it's a great, great kind of all-in-one. It's a 30-day mold detox box, and I'm so excited. So thank you for letting me mention that because today's the launch, <laughs> so it's out there. No, I'm excited. Yes. I, I actually looked it up the other day because I was sending somebody to, to, to get that, and it's like, I don't know if it's available yet, but here's yes. where you need to go to thank get you. it. So that's thank awesome. You. It's going to be great. I love that we can collaborate because, again, I can't do what I do without you, Jeff. You are just a gem. You're so wonderful at what you do. You're so generous with your time today. I know that's valuable, but I know both of us together today hopefully have answered questions and helped a lot of people. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here with me. No, thank you, Jill. That's been phenomenal. Uh, anything I can do to help along the way, that's what I'm here for. Awesome. We'll talk soon.